uh, the book of Deuteronomy, and we've got quite a chunky passage to go through today, so I'm not going to read it all, but it would be really great if you had a Bible or had a on a phone uh, that you could follow it through with. I think there are some more Bibles in the cupboard. If anyone would like one, then you'd be really welcome. I think Jan's on the case, so that's that's great. I think it'd be a good idea to do that. Uh, just really helpful. Again, just uh, most of you know who I am. My name's Chris. I'm, I co-lead with Chrissy, and it's uh, it's great to be here. I've, um, I'm recovering from COVID, so thank you for your good wishes. I'm better. I'm testing negative. Um, but I've, I've just had to restrain myself from um, singing to that beautiful worship because I've got two services to sing at and two services to preach at, and uh, just needed to contain my voice. But it was thank you very much. I just really great to, to come into the presence of God. So we're in, like I said, we're in the book of Deuteronomy, we're going through it uh, week by week. We're going to have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 2. So if you are in one of the, the Blue Church Bibles, it's on page 179, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2, and I'm going to read, we're going to go the whole, we're going to go through, I think we'll pick it up, we're going to go from Deuteronomy 2 through to 3 verse 11. So it's like a chapter and a, quite a chunk. So I'm not going to read it all, I'm going to miss some bits out, but you can follow through as we go. <coughs> so, this is Moses talking to the Israelites. It says this, Then we turned back and set out towards the wilderness along the route to the Red Sea, as the Lord had directed me. For a long time we made our way around the hill country of Seir, and the Lord said to me, you have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. Give the people these orders. You are about to pass through the territory of your relatives, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. They will be afraid of you, but be very careful. Do not provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land, not even enough to put your foot on I've given Esau, the hill country of Seir, uh, as his own. You are to pay them in silver for the food you eat and the water you drink. The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you and you have not lacked anything. So we went on past our relatives, the descendants of Edor, Esau, who lived in Seir, and we turned uh, from the Arabah road, which comes up from Elah, and some other complicated words, Ezion, Geba, and travelled along the desert of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, do not harass the Moabites or provoke them to war, for I will give you, I will not give you any part of their land. I have given Ah to the descendants of Lot as a possession. So then there's a, there's a bit of an explanation about all the, who those people are. And, um, and then in verse 13, and the Lord said, now get up and cross the Zered Valley, the Zered Valley, so we crossed the valley. 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea, from the very beginning, until we crossed the Zered Valley. And by then, that entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. The Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. And then what God says in the next bit, he goes on and says, now that, now that those guys that have um, were rebelled against me, and I'll go back over this in a minute, now you're dead, we're going to move on, you can move, move forward. And he says, today you're going to pass on. And then he comes to another place where he says, look, I don't, I don't want you um, where the Ammonites are. This is in verse 16, where the Ammonites are. I don't want you to take this land. I want you to pass through again. And, uh, and then in verse 24, he says to them, I don't want you to, so he said to them, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to do this. And then in verse 24, he says, set out now and cross the Arnon Gorge. See, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his country. Begin to take possession of it and engage him in battle. This very day I will begin to put the terror and fear of you on all the nations under heaven, and they will hear reports of you and will tremble and be in anguish because of you. 
And then the story goes on and they win that battle and they win that city uh, for the Lord. And, uh, and then we move on into, ver into um, chapter 3. And uh, after they've won that battle and they've moved through as, they, as God had asked them, it says this. Next, we turned and went up along the road towards Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, with his whole army, marched out to meet us in battle at Edre. And the Lord said to me, do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his whole army and his land. Do to him what you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Hezbollah. And then verse 3 says this, And the Lord our God also gave into our hands Og, king of Bashan, and all his army, and uh, we struck them down. And so, it's quite a big chunk of, of words here, isn't it, in terms of explaining what God's doing. And, it, and uh, three times he says to the Israelites, Don't, you're not going to take possession of this bit of the land. You've got to move on. And then he says twice, he says, now these are the battles that you're going to win. This one and this one. And as I was preparing this, I was thinking like, well, how do we know? How did they know what they were supposed to be doing? And uh, I thought, well, there's, there's three things that we can learn from here. How they, they, they moved through the land and how they, they won the battles that God was saying. And the first thing that they had to do was actually to listen to God. Okay, they had to hear what God was going to say because he gave different instructions, didn't he? They had to listen to God. Secondly, they had to actually trust him uh, because... You know, it's okay listening to him, but if you're not going to put into uh, to, to, to trust what he's saying, if you don't believe quite what he's saying or, or who he is, then you, that's going to be, cause you a problem, isn't it? And then the third thing they had to do was to obey God. So listen to God, trust God, and obey God. And that's what I want to pick up on as I come through the, the sermon today. As we start off, I just wanted to tell you a, a story uh, uh, about a... Uh, a parachute jump that I did once. So, uh, uh, quite a few years ago, when I was a bit more able, a bit more younger, a bit more younger, can you be a bit more younger? Um, when we came to Stafford, um, the hospital, I worked in the hospital. My, my background is uh, an NHS manager. I was working in Stafford Hospital. And they were raising money for the first ever CT scanner to put, go into that hospital. And uh, there was a guy who worked in the uh, works department I was in the management department and he worked for me. And every weekend he used to go off and go um, uh, skydiving. And um, I, he was really excited about this and really enthusiastic. I said, well, that would be a really interesting thing to do. He said, you could come. I said, no, I couldn't. He said, yes, you could come. And so uh, he told me about it. He said, well, they do this thing called um, tandem jumping, where you link up with a, an experienced um, guy and you jump with them. I thought, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. So I decided I'd, I'd jump and raise money for this um, CT scanner that they were having in the hospital. So anyway, it was good. I sent out, I got lots of publicity. It was in the local papers and all sorts of stuff. And uh, loads of people sponsored me. I came to the day, and uh, it was a day a bit like this. It was, it was clear and no, no, um, wasn't really very sunny, but it wasn't raining. Went out to some airfield in Leicestershire. And um, never met this bloke before, but he comes up and he says, I'm, he's got long grey hair and he looks a man of experience. And he said, right, okay, I'm going to be your instructor. And I explained to him that I'm on crutches, you can see that. And he said, yeah, that's no problem, no problem. So he said, listen, I want you to listen to me really carefully. And then he went through a briefing for about an hour. This is what, this is what I'm going to do. This is what, and we, we practiced like lying on a thing, like this is what we're going to do, and all that sort of stuff. And he went through and talked it all through. And I, did I listen? Did I listen? <laughs> I, was, I was really focused, right? Yeah, I know exactly what's happening. And he said, look, you don't need to... He said, no, you were I said, yeah, I'm a bit scared. <laughs> he said, you don't need to worry. I've done this loads of times before. I'm very experienced. I got... It's all OK. I thought, yeah, that's good. I trust you. And it, so first I listened. Then I had to... Am I going to trust my life to this guy? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then we got in the plane. And in this plane, there was a whole bunch of other people that were going skydiving. It was just me doing the tandem jump. All of the others that did it like every week as part of their... And it was all blokes. 
whole testosterone field, <laughs> like, you know, joking with each other, like, you know, I'm going to push you out, and, I, and we started going up, and, and if you're doing a skydive, you, you um, like, when you're in a plane, you normally, like, take off, but you gradually go up and up, well, if, if the only purpose of going up in the plane was to get high, so we were going circling round and round and going high and high, and they had the door open. <laughs> right? So here we go. And my heart is beating, and unfortunately. But, um, and the tension was built, and then gradually the guys started to be a bit quieter, and you could sense that we were getting to there. And, and then the guy gave the final briefing this is what we're going to do. And you had to make a decision then. I had to make a decision. Am I going to do this? And I'm going to say, actually, no. And I decided I would. And he said, right, we're going to the door. And off we went, got to the door. He said, one, two, three. And we went. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be 100% committed. And um, so we went, we dived like 30, 40 seconds, free dive, going, uh, and goodness knows, I don't know what the speed is. Those that you know about gravity, you'd be able to tell me what the speed is, but it was very fast. And then the parachute opened and I was able to breathe because <laughs> I knew then that it was all okay. And it was amazing. I got the biggest adrenaline rush of my life. We, it we floated down beautifully to see the countryside and everything and we landed safely. And I was like absolutely buzzing, absolutely buzzing. Um, and it was amazing. But in order to do that experience, I had to do those three things that I'm going to talk to you about. I had to listen, and boy, like I said, boy, did I listen. Secondly, I had to trust. Was this someone I was going to put my trust in? Did I, did I, was I going because it's all in, isn't it? It's all or nothing. And thirdly, am I going to take that action? Am I going to obey what the guy says? Am I going to follow through with taking that action? So I tell you that story because it, it just, I just bear that in mind as we go through these, um, these Bible verses. I'm just going to recap a little bit um, from Deuteronomy chapter 1. The story so far is that the, um, the Israelites, Moses has led the Israelites, they, they've, um, uh, you know, they, they, they've come to the point where, where God, they've come to the point where they can see the promised land. This is back in chapter 1. They, they got there before and um, Moses, they're, they're ready to go into the promised land that the Lord has led them to after a period in the wilderness. And he goes back and he tells them the story of how they got there. He said, you got here once before, didn't you? You got here once before and um, uh, you saw the promised land and you rebelled. And God had said to them, uh, in, if you've got your Bible with you, look, um, chapter 1, verse 8, he said to them, see, I've given you this land, go in and take possession of it. Uh, but the Lord swore he would give to your fathers. And uh, so the Lord had brought them there the first time and said, this is the promised land. And uh, if you look in chapter 1, verse 21, it says, see the Lord your God has given you the land, go up and take possession of it. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. This is Moses talking to his people. But, but, they didn't do it. They sent spies up to have a look, and the spies came back and said, this land is great, but the people, if you look in verse 28, it says, um, uh, chapter 1, verse 28, let me just find that. Uh, our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there, the, the giant, the giant people. And uh, so, Mo so Moses, through God, says to them, verse 29, and I said, don't be terrified, don't be afraid. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you. But you look on again, we've had this story and we're picking this up in the last few weeks. Verse 32, in spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey. So they didn't, they didn't trust him. They didn't put their trust in God at that point. And, um, uh, and then God was angry. And we, we, Chrissy picked this up last week when she was preaching, God was angry with them because they'd sinned, they rebelled. They said, we don't really want to do what you've asked us to do, God. We're too frightened to do it. And then verse 41 uh, in chapter 1, then he replied, they realised God was angry at God, we have sinned against the Lord, we'll go up and fight them now as the Lord has commanded us. And verse 42, God said, no, don't do that. 
because uh, I'm not going to fight for you. And yet they did. They went, they were arrogant. You know, Chrissy, she said last week they were arrogant. They thought, oh, we've got to make it right. God said, don't do it. And they went and did it. And so this is, and then they were defeated, obviously, because God didn't fight for them. And this is where we pick up the story in chapter 2. We can see, so, so just bear in mind that they, they should be, they needed to listen to the Lord. And we can see that in the story that God is giving them really clear directions through Moses. When we read in, in chapter 2, uh, if you see verses 2 to 3, the Lord said to me, you have made your way around this hill country long enough now, now turn north. Turn north, it's a clear instruction, isn't it? Um, and then verse 4, he says, Give the people in these orders. You're about to pass through the territory of your relatives. They will be afraid of you, but be very careful. So, don't, in other words, don't be tempted. As you go through, you'll see that they're, they're frightened of you, and you could want to attack them, but be careful. That's not what I've said. Verse 5, do not provoke them for war, for I will not give any of their land, not even enough to put their foot on. So they had to listen, because God was giving really clear instructions. And then verse 9, you see, they, they go through there, and then they come to the, where it says, where, where the Moabites is, the Lord said, do not harass the Moabites or provoke them, for I will not give you any part of their land. I have given our, their land, to the descendants of Lot as a possession. I've given it to the Moabites. Don't provoke them. And down to, um, you're following through with me, Verse 19, when you come to the Ammonites, do not harass them or provoke them to war, for I will not give you possession of any land belonging to the Ammonites. Don't do it. Three times, God says don't. And then we come to verse 24, which we read earlier. He says, set out now and cross the island. See, I've given into your hands Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon and his country begin to take possession of it and engage him in battle. And verse 33, they have it, it talks about the battle, and then it says, um, uh, verse 32, when Simon and all his army came out to meet us in battle, the Lord our God delivered him over to us, and we struck him down together with his sons and his whole army. God said go, and they did. But they had to listen. And again, you can see when we came to chapter 3, again God said this, we're going to do the same again now to the king of Bashan. So my point is that we have to hear what God wants us to do, don't we? We have to listen. Maybe you've got, um, it's very tempting to take things into our own hands, right? So we think, oh, this isn't quite working out. I want to do it this way. God says, is that what God has really said? Are the plans that you're uh, wanting to move on now, you might have plans in your head, plans for a new job or to move house or I don't know what it is, wh whatever it is that, that you're planning. The question for you is, is these, these your plans? Or are they God's plans? Have you heard from God? Maybe it's about starting something new. Maybe it's about joining a small group. I don't know what it is. Is it your plan or is it God's plan? The first thing is to hear from God. And to do that, what do we need to do? We need to put ourselves in that place where we can hear from him. We need to make time to read our Bible, don't we? And spend time praying and listening to God. Maybe share with other Christians who bring wisdom and to, to challenge us on some of our thinking. The Israelites had Moses, didn't they? So God is speaking clearly to Moses who puts that through to the, to, to the Israelites. But we don't need that intermediate because we have Jesus. And Jesus has made a way. Uh, Jesus <coughs> says, I am the way to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 4, uh, verse 14 says this, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy find grace to help us in our time of need. We can approach God with confidence, knowing that he'll hear us and he'll speak to us. But we need to make that time. 
So the first thing um, is, to, uh, is to listen to God. The second thing I think we can learn from these verses, there's lots of verses here, is to trust in God. So, um, yeah, got to trust in God. The reason why Moses was telling them this story of their history as they stood on the brink of the promised land again was to remind them that they could trust God and they had to trust God. When God says he'll do it, he will do it. They didn't go, they didn't get to go into the promised land the first time because they didn't absolutely trust God. They trusted their own feelings and fears. And what a mess that got them into, isn't it? The thing that they were most afraid of, we read it, they were most afraid of strong, tall enemies and the fortified cities. That says that in chapter 1, verse 28. And here, in these verses in chapter 2, God, through Moses, is showing them they didn't need to be afraid of those things, those tall people and those cities. God gives the land to the whom he chooses. So we just look uh, again through these verses. I'm going to pick out a couple that we can look at. So um, chapter 2, uh, verse 5. This is when God said, you know, uh, I'm not going to give you this land, not even enough to put your foot on. I've given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. Who's given it to them? God has given it to them. Chapter 2, uh, verse 9. Then the Lord said to me, to Moses, do not harass the Moabites and provoke them, for I'm not giving you any part of their land. I have given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. God has given it to them. It's not for you, for me. You know, trust me. And as he goes through this, and a couple of times he says this, we, we see that there's some verses here that, that show us that originally the people here were uh, strong. So in verse in verse 10, after he said this, that he's given it to them, so the Emites used to live here, people strong and numerous and as tall as the Anakites. In other words, these guys were pretty scary people, but God had given this to these to Lot as his possession. So the, the Israelites themselves said they were scared of these things, but God said, look, these people are big and scary, but I've already sorted this for this group of people. And again and again, he goes through and shows them this. And then when they, what, then they, they, they go up and they have the battle with the kings, and uh, we can see, you know, the two things they were scared of, they were scared of the big giants and the people who were stronger and bigger than them. They were also scared of the fortified cities. And God won the battle for them uh, when they fought the, the king of uh, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and... Um, he delivered victory to them in verse 24. He says, I'm going to give you the victory on this. And if you just, I want you to look down at verse 36. If you've got a Bible with you, they, they, they got the victory and then they went through the towns to plunder. And it says this, from Aroa to the rim of Aaron Gorge, from the town in the gorge, even as far as Gilead, not one town was too strong for us. They had a victory over all the towns and not one time was too strong for us. And again, in chapter 3, one more verse to look at. Verse 5 in chapter 3, they, they won the battle. Verse 4, it says, we, that time we took all these cities. There was not one of the 60 cities that we did not take from them. Verse 5, all these cities were fortified with high walls and with gates and bars. So God is showing them. This, this is how we've done it before. Right? You didn't trust me before, but in these things, I've, I've given over these lands to, to the right people at the right time, even though they were big, even though they were scary. And in the battles that you've now been with me through, I've, we've overcome these cities, even though we were too afraid because the cities were too big and too strong. They had high, um, high walls with gates and bars. Just um, one final thing I just wanted to draw your attention to. At the very end of verse 11, um, uh, the king of Bashan was called Og, and they defeated him. And just at the very end, at the brackets, 
Verse 11, it says, Old King of Bashan was the last of the Raphaites, which means that they were these giant, huge, giant people. And it says this, which was just a really interesting aside. His bed was decorated with iron and was more than nine cubits long and four cubits wide. And apparently that means that it was like 14 metres long and 1.8 metres wide. So it was massive because he was a giant. And this is being put in there to say like, that God can slay even the giants. They're massive, massive people. So don't be afraid. When we, uh, we had a leadership team meeting um, last week and we were reflecting on our story as a church a little bit about how God uh, had led us uh, we used to meet in a church here, which was much smaller than the size of the church that we've got here now, and um, we, uh, we became too big, and we had to move, and we uh, were led up to uh, a big building on the technology park, BP Technology Park, and um, it was a real scary thing to do, because when we left here, we had to lease that building, and it was very expensive to lease it. Many of you will know this story, some of you won't. Um, but we had in our bank account the amount of money that would last for three years to lease that building. And then we didn't have any more. And our income wasn't going to cover it. But we made that decision that God was calling us there. That's what we needed to do. We needed to trust him. And God would sort it. And we went. And God, after the end of that three years, we had the same amount of money in our bank account as when we started. It was a real miracle. A miracle. Of, of, of things and God blessed us and we grew and we flourished and then you know uh, just Covid came didn't it and you know the church was in a difficult position and there were some <coughs> strained relationships and also that we were um, uh, we weren't able to run our conferencing and our bistro we ran a conference centre and a bistro there and it really blessed people and uh, because of Covid we had to close that down and God showed us that we were going to have to move out from there. And we were facing a huge debt, a massive debt. And, uh, and yet God, through his people, provided generously to meet that debt. And we were able to close it down, we were able to pay off the landlord, and we were able to move back to here, which in itself is amazing, because this building is, is changed beyond recognition of those that remember what it was like with a little um, quarter cabin, prefabricated building, and we've just seen God's hand in this. And I see God's hand in it because uh, would I have wanted to move from the beacon, from where we were? No, I wouldn't have chosen that. I was invested in that building. I loved it, and I, you know, I was there when we went, and God led us. And, but God had a different purpose for us. I believe very much that God has given us a vision as a church of being uh, one church, many beacons, growing disciples. So we are all together as one church, but we're going to be meeting in smaller congregations across Stafford at different places at different times. And if we had that one building still, the tendency would be for us to want to go back and to, to have a one big congregation. But God closed that opportunity for us, closed that door, and said, no, this is my purpose for you. And I really believe that. It means that we have to be all in. You know, as we grow here, it's great to see so many people here today. What, there's going to come a time when we're not going to fit in again. And we're going to have to do something else. Praise God. But I believe that won't be to get a much bigger building. But I believe that will be to start growing another congregation as we, as we do. Because I think that's the way God's leading us. And we've got to trust God. We've got to listen. We've got to hear what is God saying to us. And then we've got to trust God. And then the third thing we've got to do, and the third thing they had to do, was to, uh, was to obey. They heard what the Lord had to say. They looked back at what the Lord had done for them, but they still had to obey. They still had to take action. And this time, this time they, they did obey God. They didn't attack when they shouldn't have attacked. And then when God said go, they were ready to go. See, we have to put our faith into action, don't we? If we really believe we've heard something from God, and we really believe that God is trustworthy, and we know that he is, he's faithful, 
you'll never let us down. We've sung that wonderful song that he'll never, what was that? The words that you'll never, he's never failed us. Never failed us. I love that. So the question is, if there's something that God is prompting you to do, have you heard from him? Check. Have you really heard from him? Do you trust him? Do you really, do you trust him enough to throw yourself out of a plane with him? Then step out in faith. Go do it. Or maybe you're facing a difficult situation, a big giant, if you like. Someone who sleeps in that big bed. But God says, and you want to run away, everything about you wants to run away from that situation, but God's saying, stay. I'm going to see you through. Face up to it with me. He will see you through. Because God's trustworthy. Or maybe you're tangled up in a sin and you can't get free. But God can and will set you free. God is the God of victory. We see that in the Bible here, in the stories about the Israelites winning the victory. How much more did Jesus Christ win the victory on the cross <coughs> when he conquered death and sin? And we can live in that victory, can't we? So if there's a sin that's entangled you that you want to break free of, just take it to Jesus. Confess that sin. The Bible says, doesn't it, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has the victory. So, listen to what God says. Trust in him. He's trustworthy. And obey. I want to tell you one final story. Again, again, it's a personal story. It's about me and God speaking to me. I don't hear God's voice very often. I can't claim that I'm a prophet or anything like that. But sometimes you know that you know, don't you, that God has spoken to you. Have you had that experience? And if you haven't, then be open to it. Because sometimes God does it in a little voice. Sometimes he does it in a showing it through friends or people who are Christians. One day, um, I, I've been in this church a long time. I was just reflecting on it the other day with uh, uh, Chrissy was doing a, a podcast and was asking me about how long I've been in the church. I've been in this church over 30 years, 34 years, I think it is now. And um, there was one I've been in leadership a lot of that time, but there was this period of time about 15 years ago when I stepped back from leadership, very busy life, four kids, full time job as a senior manager in the health service. Can you imagine what stress that is like? Uh, not the kids, the health service. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'd stepped back from leadership and there was a town wide mission going on. And I, I went to this, we were fully into it, and uh, we were just having a time of worship. And I clearly heard God say to me, Chris, I want you to step back into leadership. And I'm like, I'm too busy. I can't do that. He said, you've got to, got to do this. And I just felt, I just knew, I just knew that I knew that God had spoken to me. It was something that the, the preacher had said, I think, I don't really remember who it was, but I just absolutely knew. And um, our minister was Elaine at the time, so a lady minister, and um, I said, I, after the service, I said to Elaine, I've got to really tell her I've got to come and step back into the to leadership in, in the church. And she said, Oh, she said, that's, um, that's really timely. I said, all right, okay. And that was it. And then a, a few months later, I don't know this, she said that, Elaine said that she was going to leave the church. She was giving notice that she was moving on. And, um, and that she thought that I should take up leading the church. I thought, really? I know that I was, God said to step in, but I didn't, you didn't mean that, God, did you? <laughs> and um, I had all sorts of reasons why I couldn't. I like, you know, I like I said, really busy work life, family. You know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have to drop my hours at work. I'm going to have to speak to my boss. And you know, we're going to have less money. I've got a mortgage on the house. We've got a mortgage on our house, and 
how's that going to work, and all these sort of things. But somehow I knew that God had said, I didn't know that he'd said that specifically, but anyway, the church asked me to do it, and I said, look, and I had, I've listened, I've heard you, God, do I trust you? Do I trust you? I looked back over my life and seen that when God had spoken to me before, and I'd committed myself, he, he would. He would deliver. And so I, I said, yes, I would. And I, I went to my boss and I said, <laughs> can I reduce my hours? I want to reduce my hours. I want to do one day a week or less. He said, why? <laughs> I said, well, I want to go and help lead the church. Our minister's leaving and I've been asked to lead the church and I really feel that this is that. And he said, that's great. Why don't you go and do that? How many hours do you want to work? I said, oh, well, uh, okay. He said, I'll write a letter and we'll sort it all out. And so he did that. It was really easy. God had made the way. He'd gone before. So I cut my hours down, dropping salary. And then the mortgage rate came crashing down. It was back in that time when the mortgage rates were really high. We were, we were paying, I don't know, £1,000 a month or something on our mortgage. It came right down. And uh, the money that I'd lost from giving up my work, we didn't have to pay in our mortgage. God had it in hand. Was it easy at that, that period of two or three years when I led, um, often with Lawrence, um, with, the, with the deacons of the church, and with Matt, who was wonderful? Um, no, it wasn't. But was it the right thing to do? Yes, it was. And I, I know, I know that I know that God used me in that time. But if I hadn't have heard from him, I wouldn't have done it. I think if the minister had come to me and said, Chris, why don't you leave the church? Uh, and I hadn't already heard from God, I would have gone, no, there's no way. Because that's too hard, too difficult. But God finds a way. So I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, you know, I'm not telling you that because I think I'm a great person, but I just occasionally I hear from God. And when you hear from God, go for it. Because God will make a way. God will make a way.